Hello, this is R. Rats with Lesson 005 of my program. First, I'd like to thank everybody that's made it this far. That means you've looked at Lesson 001 through Lesson 004. Uh, thanks, guys, so much. This really helps me. The uh, comments I've been getting are really encouraging. All right, uh, let's just summarize where we've come so far real quick. Lesson 001 set out the framework for what we're going to do. Now I could have made that lesson 20 hours long and I'm going to have to expand on a number of things as we proceed uh, about what was pointed out in that lesson and I'm even going to contradict a couple things but you'll understand when we get there. And then lesson 002 basically the purpose of that it showed a couple of things number one you don't need to prepare an opening deeply in order to win a game especially against a stronger player and uh, it also showed you uh, my skill and my talent as a chess player and then lesson number zero zero three showed how uh, when you're playing black you control the opening you get white moves first but you get to pick what line there is and here I played uh, a very obscure line and with very little original analysis to it except I had it in my possession and I had the will and desire to sit down and work the, that those games out so those two correspondence games uh, I played very well and it prepared me for the uh, one game that I played that line over the board and then lesson 004 uh, showed how to go about analyzing a over the board game that you've played and even though my rating was 1880 and I played up and down about that strength throughout the game the analysis at the end is most likely 2600 or higher right because I stopped and worked everything out so you too can play or analyze at above a master level before you're even a master okay I want to make that clear so it's not that hard for you guys to get up to master if that's your goal and that's what the goal of this course is I say I can make anyone a chess master if you follow my methods so sometimes you're gonna think uh, like a master and you're gonna play like a master and we just gotta get you where you can do that on a c consistent basis and so we're gonna get there okay and then also like with lesson four it also showed or lesson zero zero three it also showed how take meticulous notes and work everything out so that you're prepared uh, whenever the next move comes along okay so what I'm gonna do in lesson zero zero five is expand on a, f a few notes uh, in it and I'm gonna give you a little little bit more background on certain things that are related to all this uh, I throughout my career I've listened to what stronger players say and I still listen to them because I value their opinion and okay for instance the the young master that I played in lesson 004 he was giving some advice to one rising uh, junior player in our area some 30 some years ago he's uh, the this one new player was uh, an English opening player C4 and what my uh, future uh, well, the Fide Master was telling this young boy was switch your openings get away from playing C4 you're a positional player and you're good but your tactics need improvement start playing E4 now your rating is going to suffer a little bit at first but don't worry you'll get it back uh, because when your rating is lower you gain points quicker coming back up but after you've done this for six months a year whatever you think it takes then go back to playing your English opening C4 and you will have a whole new understanding of of how to handle positional games because you'll develop an incredible tactical insight and that's what this player did and he ended up quitting the game and that's not to discourage you he ended up quitting the game because of life circumstances but he was definitely making improvement we could see that he was really coming along fine uh, but that was his story and another story I'd just like to tell uh, I've been saying don't prepare openings don't go way deep and learn all these openings when your rating is lower uh, because you're spending so much time learning something that you're not going to have a, a great deal of use for when you actually play because you're not going to find these variations appearing for you okay there's a strong uh, friend of mine here at ICC that that believes that you should study openings and know what the positions are and know how to play them well he's right too it's just the difference in our thinking and it's a friendly disagreement is that I believe that approach is more so 
important for you when your rating really goes up. When your strength gets above 2,000, 2,100, 2,200, then yeah, that's what you want to do. You want to be studying these openings, but now you've got the ability to uh, make the most of these situations. So this is just, uh, like I say, uh, friendly banter between chess masters. You listen to us. We, we made it. You're going to get there, but listen to us, what we have to say, and duplicate our success. So you don't always want to just listen to what I have to say. I have a focus plan here, uh, but there's plenty of other uh, useful information you can hear from stronger players. And anybody stronger than you, you want to listen to them. And maybe his idea isn't right, but if it's better than yours, it'll at least help you come up a little bit. And then eventually you'll realize he or she wasn't right, and you can make the... Uh, proper adjustment. Okay, so what I want to do now is break my rule, <laughs> and you'll see why. Uh, I'm going to break my rule and give you a little opening preparation. I'm going to show you some variations I suggest you play, and there's a reason for all this. Uh, here, make it, let's make it simple. As I said in the lesson 003, white moves first, but black has to choose the opening. Okay, now if you're white, now you're in this situation where uh, you got to play against whatever their preparations are. Well, let's just say, for instance, you you want to you're an E4 player, and you've studied maybe in the past. You know the Rui Lopez pretty well. You're prepared to meet a martial attack and all the other formations that Black can set up, uh, and you can do okay with it. Well, the problem is Black probably has about five or six other variations before that, before you even reach that position that you can get into. And that's an awful lot of extra preparation for you. Well, what happens if if we can shortcut it down to where you make a divergence early in every opening that Black plays against you so that he's not going to be able to prepare uh, play his prepared analysis. Instead, he's coming into playing your prepared analysis. And that's a big difference. And I'll just give you a quick example here. Uh, I knew a player oh, close to 30 years ago as white. Um, he liked to play the, uh, I guess it's the Goring Gambit. Okay. Okay. And now the, the, the line here is to play C3. And what was happening was everybody who was playing, everybody, was declining the Gambit and playing D5. Now, this is a perfectly, perfectly good move, but what was happening is every game this this person played started like this so he became quite good at handling this position nobody was accepting accepting the gambit but why why would you want to play into this line if he knows it very well and he's familiar with all the lines and all the strategies doesn't make sense so let's go back let's just go back and run through the first few moves I had to play him and I was going to be black and my preparation was that I was going to accept his gambit. Now, I'm not going to show you the game. Uh, it's not important right now, but I went ahead and took. Okay, and then he plays here, and then I take here. Now, what's happened is I'm two pawns up. If I can refute this gambit, I'm going to win. So instead of having to struggle against a, a, a system that he knows quite well as white, I'll take the uh, defensive here and accept the two pawns and work my way out of it. And that's exactly what happened. So here, you see, you see my point? I want something that I'm ready to play, not something that he's ready to play. Okay, so let me go back and I'm going to kind of show you an opening. There's a book. It's called The Chess Opening for You. I've barely looked at it and I haven't even seen it in probably 30 or years or longer. It's kind of old. But essentially, it gives a, a position that white plays or a set of openings moves that white pretty much plays against anything black plays. And just to illustrate it, I'm just going to make a white move and I'm going to start shuffling black pieces around. Not to to show that black has a bad game, of course, if he has no development. I just want you to focus on what white's doing here and see the white system. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to be moving this uh, black knight back and forth just as I set up the position. Okay, and give you an idea of what white's key moves are okay now eventually you go here and like I say everything kind of follows suit and this goes here and white continues this will go to here 
at some point and so the bishop can get to e3 and it can't be kicked by a knight okay you with me and then I think knight goes here and the knight goes back there's some variations where maybe you're gonna put the rook on e1 let's just hold it and uh, and then you play here and maybe the bishop you, you might leave uh, e3 open for the bishop so the knight can get back to e3 but this is kind of the system that they that they set up and in all the time I've been playing tournament chess and blitz chess I've seen quite a number of people that that uh, will play this system and it's not bad if you look at a couple of things it gets all your pieces out and I've always stressed development in if you're not sure of the book move in uh, development is usually the, the correct choice so you're getting all your pieces out and you can start developing a way to uh, consistency and understand how to handle this position from the white side so maybe it is maybe it's a chess opening for you uh, maybe it isn't but uh, if your repertoire is expanded then uh, you, you become a little more versatile and you may want to play a system like this against the player you know who may have your goat maybe he he knows how to handle your favorite lines and you want to try something else we'll try this you know you should be able to play all positions you should be able to play all openings but that's something you'll build as you get a little better okay so let's back it all the way up to the start now here's what I'm gonna do since you're white in in all these games and you're an e4 player we're, we're gonna start with e4 uh, let's talk about some of the possible moves that that uh, variations we can play okay first point Bach has how many good moves here okay g3 e6 e5 that's three four five six seven even eight nine so at least nine moves maybe I missed one so black has at least nine good moves that you have to be prepared for so let's run through each of those nine moves and find a perfect perfectly acceptable variation for white to play against each one of those if we do that we've really cut our work down and then we can focus more on learning a position that we're going to be expert with much like that first example I gave with the gentleman that played the Goring Gambit and always had a decline position he got into a position a lot and he was used to playing it now if you can shortcut all this you're gonna get into something you play a lot and remember this contradicts the theory that says although white moves first black chooses the opening well now white's choosing the opening now let me just back up one second uh, as I explained I had my in lesson 003 I had my system set up for how to play uh, against uh, e4 and d4 and as white the way I avoided most of the uh, chances for my opponent to play his favorite line was I simply played c4 and this gets uh, black out of most of his regular setup so I'm not sure if c4 is the move for you we'll be talking more about this opening as this course progresses but it's not the most common move uh, played uh, by chess players e4 is the most popular so we're going to cover that one first and I'll show you some recommended lines you might want to have a pen and pencil out so you can write some of these down in many cases I'm just gonna say this is where you start studying in a few cases I'm gonna stop and show you a couple ideas because I think yeah you need to know this okay so e4 now let's look at the all the possible replies okay let's just get e5 out of the way it's the most common now here's my recommended line play knight f3 now you've got about five let's see let's count them out how many moves can black play here that are good he can play knight f6 he can play uh, d6 he can play d5 the elephant gambit and he can play knight c6 am I missing anything well he could play the Damiano defense with knight f6 but you all know how to handle that you just take the pawn right look it up okay so let's get knight f6 out of the way first that's a common thing now here's my recommended line and I'll, it's only going to show you one move d4 study it on your own prepare it it takes black out of most of his main Petrov defense lines so d4 is your move here okay now what else can he play he can play knight c6 okay now if you play bishop c4 he has a choice knight f6 and bishop c5 he can play the Joko piano he can play the two knights defense and you have to be prepared for a lot of variations okay let's keep it simple you're gonna play the Ponzi ante opening c3 that's your that's your move 
Okay? Study it. That's yours. Now, let's see what else we can do. Okay. Oh, uh, uh, just for the sake of illustration, one problem with allowing a Lopez is you even have more variations to look at. There's the, I think it's the Cordell defense or something, and then the Schliemann, all kinds of nightmares, the birds. But anyway, let's, uh, we've got an answer for knight c6. We're going to play the Ponziani with 3c3. Okay, on d6 is the Petrov. I'm not sorry, the Philidor. Uh, my, my best recommendation is don't go into the main line with d4. Just, just focus for development, okay? Bishop c4. And the reason for this is that it gets black out of most of his main lines. And if anything, uh, white's just going to focus on development. You're going to castle. You're going to push the pawn up to d3. And your bishop is out behind the pawns. His, his, his king bishop is stuck behind. Okay? So, uh, let's back it up. What else does he have? Uh, oh, the Latvian counter gambit. Okay. Latvian counter gambit. There's a lot of interesting lines here. You might want to look at them on your own. Don't just take my word for it. There's a sacrificial line with bishop c4. There's, um, and then there's, uh, but I think the main line I want you to focus on is just knight takes e5. This is safe and solid, and you should be fine with this. Okay. Now, the other thing is on the elephant gambit, uh, I'm going to have you focus on one line here. But but I want you to be aware of both of them. So I'm not really going to give you a priority. You need to look at this. The, the elephant gambit is kind of rare, but it does come up. But but those are your main moves. Takes, takes on d5 or takes on e5. And you might want to take a look at it and see what you can come up with. Okay, so what have we missed? Have we missed anything? We've got the Petrov. we got it all. Okay, now, what happens if he doesn't play e5? Well, he's going to play, let's get e6 out of the way. Now, here's my recommended line, d4. Okay, now I'm going to go ahead and recommend knight c3 here. And we're going to really shortcut a lot of this. You're, you'll like this. Okay, you do need to be aware of the exchange variation. Uh, Jacques Mises, a master about 120 years ago, liked to play this. Uh, You'll have to prepare for that. But there's two main moves you have to prepare for. And here they come. Okay. Bishop b4. That's the common one. Now, there's two moves here. I'm not going to show you all this stuff to this. You'll have to look it up. Take your pick. Bishop d3 or, here's a favorite of mine, uh, knight e2. Now, here I have to divert just a little bit and show you something. Let, let me just show you the two main themes. Okay. Black... Uh, black will usually play d takes e4 here. Now you play a3. Now there's two li two lines, bishop e7 and bishop takes c3. Let's get them both out of the way real quick. Takes, takes. Now, there's plenty of analysis on this. I think the main line is uh, knight f6. And, uh, but uh, there's a tricky line you got to be aware of. And you'll have to study this. And I think it follows a game between Alyekin and Nimzovich back around 1920 where White gambited uh, this pawn and got this incredible attack going. So you'll have to look up that and find out how to handle the two-pawn sacrifice. Okay? And like I said, there's plenty here. I'm not going to show you everything. I want to just show you the, the main ideas here. Now the other choice Black will do is they'll he'll drop the bishop back and then you play here. Now they won't always know uh, perfect theory. What often happens is you get a position like this, and then these knights are exchanged, and eventually what White's going to do it, it takes a little prep, but uh, eventually White's going to put the uh, pawn on c4. It might have to stop on c3 first, and and let's just show a couple ideas. Let's just go ahead and slow play it and play c3. Oops, it's Black's move. Okay, he may be playing uh, knight f6 here. Okay, we can play this. And it's okay if the knights get traded, but maybe not yet. Maybe Black wants to develop this way first. Okay. And eventually, White's just going to end up with just a little bit more space. Eventually, uh, 
we'd like to get the bishop to d2 and c3 and the pawn up to c4 if we can. And white's going to have just a little bit more space. Your pieces are coming out. You're fine. Okay? And it avoids all all that winnower uh, preparation that black did. That's what's so, what's so good about this uh, variation. It avoids all the main lines of, of, the, of the winnower. So let's just back up and show you just a little bit more. Okay. Okay, bishop g5. Now there's one other tricky line here that you need to know. It's the McCutcheon. And I have a, a line for that. You're going to take right here. You're not going to get into all the main junk. Uh, you're going to just play your own line. And if you get double pawns, they're not as bad as the, as they can get in, in a regular winnower. And you may, be, may even be doubling his pawns. So you really need to look this opening up. Okay. So let's say black doesn't play the, the winnower. What do we do now? Okay. Well... Here, here, white's at least okay. You can, uh, you, you're kind of on your choice here. You, you can play the, I think it's the Al Yakin Shatard attack or something. You can kind of pick, take your pick here. But white should come out of all this okay. And if you don't know, there's a trick here. For a lot of new, uh, new players walk right into it. Uh, And maybe the queen comes back here. And then if black castles, oh, you got this wonderful, wonderful attack going, you know, all kinds of nasty things happen. But anyway, we pretty much have the French defense covered. Okay, so we got to look at some other lines. Okay, let's get the, let's get the care, or no, let's get the Sicilian out of the way. What I'm going to recommend is a slow play here. Play the cl closed system. And you're going to try to take this into the same kind of position that was done at the beginning in the variations of the chess opening for you. You're going to play, you know, knight f3, followed by g3, and d3, and c3, and bishop g2 in some order. And you're going to castle, and you're going to go about your business and see how black uh, conducts his game. And this will be good practice for you to, ha to play this line. But here you avoid all of black's preparation if he's a dragon player, uh, a uh, knight or Sicilian player, what Shevetigan, anything, you avoid it all and you go into what you want. Okay, so you're going to learn learn to play this. Okay, so that covers the Sicilian defense pretty easily, huh? How about that? Okay, let's get the Karakhan out of the way. I got a clever line here. All right. Uh, some people say it's junk, but yeah, prove it. Okay. Let's see what can go wrong here. A friend of mine calls this the Carol Queen. <laughs> okay, I've had somebody play this. Now you get this little surprise move, and White uh, Black cannot take this. He's gonna he's gonna lose this in a hurry. Uh, you can check this on your own. Black is busted. Oh, how fun! How would you like to win a game uh, from this position? You know, Black's just hurting for certain. Okay, so let's get that out of the way. So Black realize Black will sit there maybe spend uh, 10, mo 10 minutes on the clock trying to figure out if he can get away with that and finally uh, I can't do it and and then you just go about your business and redeploy redeploy this knight <laughs> and eventually the white queen will go to g3 and this knight will come out to f3 in your castle and maybe this knight will go to f4 or maybe even g3 if your queen went somewhere else and, and you'll just get this great potential to launch a kingside attack. Now it's not all that easy, but uh, it gets black out of everything he knows about the Karo Khan. So what's going to happen? Most likely they're going to take here, and now you go here. Now you're kind of on your own. You have to be a little careful here. For instance, if you play a move like Bishop C4, you're going to drop the Bishop pair. Whoops! But uh, but black really or white really has nothing to fear with this, and your pieces still come out easily, and it still kind of resembles a Karakhan, uh, but it's different, and it gets black out of his bookline uh, preparations. Okay, so let's go back. We got the Karakhan covered. We're gonna play the Karo Queen. Okay, so what's left? Okay, Alyakin defense. Got a clever way here. Don't play e5. Take him out of his book. Play d3. 
you're going to play this once again just like the chess opening for you and the only thing you have to be aware of is that black may want to try to open up the king file or the d file okay now just play knight d2 and then if if there's a trade you're still going to play this like the chess opening for you you're going to be playing c3 at some point so the queen can go to c2 and then you're going to continue with knight f3 g3 bishop g2 and castle uh, you could even play bishop c4 if you want it's all out your opening preparation but now you've taken black completely out of what he's doing with his aliak and defense and you're playing your game okay now when you're 2200 and you know you're going to play somebody that plays the aliak and defense yeah now they go prepare a line for it but you're not there yet you're going to be but man this is beautiful the power that you can do when you can control the openings so this is something i discovered on my own white uh, it's true that black uh, controls the opening, but white does too. He just may not get as strong of a game as he would, but we don't care about that. We want to get a, into a position that we know and that we're comfortable with. That's the key. So what if black equalizes? So what? He's going to equalize <laughs> against anything you play if he's playing carefully. Okay, what's left? Okay, we got the Karakon. Let's get the perk out of the way. Now, one, I kind of play two different moves here. You'll have to play around. Sometimes I play f4, but I sometimes I just play uh, bishop c4. It's a perfectly good move. Okay, now you've got to be careful about a couple things. If you play knight c3, he might do the center fork trick on you. And he's spent a tempo going here, but just, just play d3. Okay, now what's he going to do? If he plays uh, g6... Uh, you can go ahead with all kinds of things f uh f four or just just start developing knight f three okay and there's a big difference in this and other perk formations is that a lot of the plans that black does aren't available because the white pawn is not on d four so it takes on a whole new game yeah you might get your bishop exchange knight c six and knight a five so what you know just go about your business black is not in familiar territory but you are okay now, Nimzovich defense. Okay, you got to know a lot if you're going to play d4, okay? You really have to know a lot, and I won't get into that now. Here's the move I'm going to recommend you play. Now, I, I play in black in this position. I got this crazy gambit. Nobody plays it. Don't worry about it. I'll show it to you someday, not today. But let's see where, we, where we've accomplished. If black plays e5, bang, we go right into our Ponziani, okay? Success. What else is he going to play? Well, you could play d5, and we just kind of go center counter style with it, okay? Or we could even play knight c3, and I have something to say about this in a moment. The idea here is if d4, now this kind of takes on a, a type of Nimzovich reversed uh, flavor, where uh, black is, or get confused on who's which, which, the black pieces here will be playing e5, and, and white will be moving the knight over to g3. And in the two e5 variations of the Nimzovich defense against 2d4, black conducts his game something like this. So white's now doing it to black, which is kind of fun. Okay, so uh, don't have to worry about uh, knight c uh, about this line too much, it, but it could come up. This is this is the recommended way I would have over pawn take, taking on d5. Okay, so let's back it up. What else is black going to do? Um, d6 well just just go about your business you can play all kinds of stuff bishop bishop uh, b5 bishop c4 you can ev even go into a kind of a perk defense where maybe the knight c6 is not what black wants to do so it's, it's kind of your choice here and if he plays e6 you're kind of in a french defense where maybe black doesn't always use the knight on c6 so you might need to look at a little bit of a little bit of theory on perk and French defenses, but he, but White should be fine here. He can play he can play d4 here and and be fine. Okay, leaves the center counter, and again here's my recommended line knight c3, and again it follows the pattern. If if uh, d4 you just play knight e2, and eventually the knight will transfer to c3, and the other knight will come to f3, and you'll get your bishop to c4, and you'll castle and start a kingside attack okay so there in a short span of about 20 minutes 
got you completely prepared to play e4 as white. Did I miss anything? Let's make sure. All right. We got the king pawn moves, the queen pawn, queen bishop pawn. Well, okay, if he plays b6, you should be fine against this move. Uh, just go ahead and seize the center. Watch out for any lines where where you get pinned. Okay, now the idea is kind of like a Lars is reversed. You're going to put some pressure on uh, e4. But you have the advantage of the temp of uh, the first move, so you should be fine. B6 uh, won't give you any any trouble. Okay, I just want to make sure I don't miss anything. Then if I do, I have to go back and start over. Oh, G6. Okay, just just go ahead and play Bishop C4. Handle it just like you would the uh, perk defense. Uh, a D6. Just go ahead, do that. Okay, I think we've covered it. Now I'm sure there's a lot of people saying, "Well, I play D4. What can you do for me here?" Okay, well here I'll show you. Okay, D4. If they play D5, yeah, just play Bishop G5 on them. That'll mess them up. There are a lot of people that do this. Uh, you just have to kind of get a feel for it. And I'll show you a little bit of a feel for it on a similar variation. Knight F6. Let's go ahead and play Bishop G5. Okay, this is a kind of tricky line. Okay, Bishop uh, or Knight E4 kicks the Bishop. Come back here. Now Black says, oh look, I can start a kingside attack, get my pawns rolling, and, and win the Bishop pair. Well, actually if, if White plays here, Black will uh, and takes white will have the open file and maybe that g5 pawn is where is weak but there's kind of a tricky move on white's behalf here it's to play f3 and I've shown this before here and there but black is pretty much committed now to taking that bishop and now look white gets a nice pawn center uh, black has this loose pawn over there and this this is totally out of book and white's got the uh, center control here. What will usually happen is something like c5 and e3 and queen b6 and just play b3 and at some point white's going to be attacking that pawn and that pawn may shove to h3. Just go by on g3, surround, win it later. Black's totally out of book here. So the d4 player really has it easy. doesn't have to prepare as much. Do bishop g5 either way. Okay, uh, that kind of brings us to the end of opening preparation. I'm sure there's a, a lot of other ways, and I'll show them to you, that you can really get your opponent out of book in, in a hurry, and you control the opening, even when you're white. But we'll get to those later. I've covered the main ones. What I want to focus now is on you playing uh, your standard tournament games. Okay, as mentioned in the first lesson, uh, where to play? Well, we know we can play online games 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Okay, let's talk about that. Uh, one thing you can do is play in the Team 4545 League. They have a new event starting up soon. The sign-ups are on. You do have to belong to ICC to do this, but uh, it's it's definitely worth it. And you'll you'll meet a lot of players. And you'll get some good games in. So the Team 4545 League is about to start. So you, you want to. And I'll have the uh, link to it in the YouTube page so you can click it and learn more about them. That means you start with 45 minutes on your clock, and every move you make, you get a 45-second uh, increment added. And that's what's uh, right here on the board. I'm kind of pointing to it with my mouse. Okay, so you got the 45-45 league. Another thing that runs on IC is the 9030 uh, chess site, and I'll there'll be a link for that. This gives you longer time to think. You start out with 90 minutes on your clock, and you get 30 minute, uh, 30 seconds increment added to your time every time you move. And they have competitive sections by class. You can investigate that. Now, also on ICC, they have the 45-minute pool. And generally speaking, I've played in it. It's not all that strong, at least from my level. But if you're getting into the game now, it's perfect for you. And one thing I found is a lot of players just play this thing like a blitz game and get really bad games, and, and I win them, win them early. Uh, maybe not the exact practice you want, but it's a, if you take your time and you need to take your time, it, it'll be good practice. And usually you don't have to sit there and wait in the pool long for a game. Oftentimes you can just type 45 into your console, and a game will immediately pop up. And yeah, if you're rated low and you get a real high player, well, good. You want to play the high player, see how he beats you. Take your time perfect for you. 
and if you get a, a lower player, well, eventually you'll get some higher ones. If you play a lower player, well, you got a competitive game for you. The only drawback is if you disconnect, you lose the game. I lost a few of my games that way. So what? You, to come back and try another one. Okay, you're going to lose games anyway. So what? So what if you lose one on a disconnection? Don't care about your rating. Just go out there and play chess. So in ICC, there's often there's plenty of ways to do it. You can advertise in Channel 90. Hey, I want to play a standard game. Uh, I suggest uh, I think one guy, Miles O'Toole. I'll mention him. He plays, uh, puts out offers for uh, 75. Anybody interested in a 70 and 5 game? That means 70 minutes and a five second in increment. And you can advertise what you want to play. I want to play 40-40. I want to play 30-30. Whatever. You'll find people. And uh, out, so outside of ICC, you can go into the other servers and do the same thing. Uh, free internet chess server. Uh, advertise. Hey, I want to play this time control. You'll find people. And there's another website I'll put here in the, uh, in the description. Uh, STC Bunch. You can place an ad there. Hi, I, I'm looking for somebody to play... Uh, uh, time control of 100 minutes and 25 second increment. You'll find somebody and I, and I say what rating uh, level you want to play. Uh, you'll find somebody, believe me, they'll, they're there or there. So you sh if you want to try to play online events, you can get them. ICC has other uh, events going. Just hang around, you'll find about them. You'll find about them. Just ask, talk to people. Hey, I'm looking for standard games. What tournaments they have? Someone's going to help you. Well, don't be shy. Just type type out what your question is in in like Channel 90 or 222, which is the Slamato event, Slamato tournaments, and you'll find it. Now, I don't rec necessarily recommend Slamato because most of their time controls are like 15 15 minute games. That's kind of like an extended blitz game. You'll do a little better there, but not exactly where you want to be. Uh, you want to be playing games for, uh, with time controls where the game will last two, three hours, four hours, what things like that. Okay, so you should have plenty of opportunities to get standard games in, no matter what your chess server, and I mentioned a few, and there's more. If you belong to them, just start looking around. You'll find them. Okay, now let's talk about tournaments, regular uh, over-the-board face-to-face. As I mentioned, wherever you live, you should find a club nearby. might have to drive a little farther for it, but any night of the week, Monday through Friday, you can find them. And again, on a weekend tournament, you can find those. So let's talk about a few strategies here. And I kind of want to point this out. Uh, I think there's a great deal to be said about how your, your physical conditioning is. And this can apply to any game, even online, when you're scheduling an online game. You generally, they tell you don't go swimming an hour after you eat. The reason is you can get, what, the bends or throw up or whatever. Just not good. Your body's digesting. Well, the same thing here. If if you have a tournament game, say at 7 p.m., don't sit down at 6.30 and have dinner because now the blood cells are going to rush out of your brain, go down to your stomach to help that meal process, okay? So try to eat two hours before the game. Check your body chemistry. You know it better than anybody else. But get your meal scheduled uh, well before you're actually playing a game so that you have full control over that, okay? Uh, ha make sure you've gone to the restroom before because before you play because you don't want to spend a couple minutes uh, using that the facilities while you your clock is ticking and you're away from the board. It's good to get up and walk around when it's your opponent's move. It's good to do that. Keep, keeps your blood circulating and uh, freshens up your mind. Um, we got to give you some more strategies here. If you really can't do without food, have something you can snack on, something you can eat that won't uh, disturb your opponent. He might not like the sound of you chewing uh, nuts or something. Might have to step away from the board, do that, whatever it takes. Okay. Uh, if you're playing, uh, a, a, you know, long weekender, here's an interesting strategy that I've used. Say it's a six-round tournament over three days. Say it's a holiday weekend, Saturday, Sunday, Monday. Okay. And say it's a long time control, so most of the games are going to last four hours. Well, a strategy I've often used in some of these events is I will skip a couple of rounds. I might skip round two and round four. Then I take a prearranged half round by. And the purpose of this is I go home after playing one game on Saturday and one game on Sunday and I get plenty of rest. Meanwhile, when I come back Monday, now I'm ready to play my last two games, but chances are whoever I'm playing my last two games against is, is now playing his fifth and sixth straight game after a long weekend. They're a little worn out. 
and I've got a, a little bit of an advantage in, in the fatigue factor. And this is probably not acceptable if you're at the top of the rating class because, uh, you know, but the, most of you aren't. You're trying to become masters. But, you know, if it's like an under 1600 section, you're rated 1599, you might not want to get, be giving up uh, half points like this. You see what I'm saying? Uh, but in an open tournament, oh, it's perfectly acceptable because you're going to get you're going to lose a game to a high rated player eventually and bring you back down. Maybe you'll beat him. You don't know. But it's just it's a strategy, something to think about. I've used it with success. Uh, your sleep schedule, it's all important. And we never know exactly how we're going to feel. We come down with a head cold or a migraine headache or a toothache. We don't know. Some of these things happen. Pressure at work, pressure in the family. These can all affect your chest. But if that's the case, if it's too much and you can't concentrate, don't play. Find another tournament. Okay. I want to cover something else I thought of uh, that I missed on, on the online chess if you're playing online. If you're playing a standard game, don't sit here in front of the monitor and play your game like you would a blitz game. In other words, don't just look at this position uh, in two dimensions. You need to have a chessboard set up right next to the computer. Now ideally, if you're in a situation where a family member or, or good friend can be there, you're going to have your back to the computer or somewhere in, in the room and you're going to have a full tournament chess set set up and you're going to be sitting there just like you're playing somebody except nobody's sitting across from you. Now your partner in crime who's helping you out here, they will uh, come over, they will find out what move their op your opponent played, come over and play it on your board and then step back and wait for the other one to happen. And this works great in a case where your wife supports your chess. She can sit here at the, at the uh, control, put headphones on so that the, the sound doesn't disturb you. And when there's a move, she'll hear the click. Oh, look up. There's the move. Take the headphones off, walk over, step, play the move, come back and wait, read her book, do her knitting, whatever she's doing. And both of you enjoy each other's company. You're both doing things. You're together. It's great. And <laughs> so you didn't have to abandon the wife for the weekend to play chess. You're right there at home with her or that weeknight or, you know, your son or daughter, maybe they can sit there and work on the computer, uh, uh, do something else, and when they hear that telltale sound of a move, they come back up, here, gotta, gotta get dad a move, go over there and play it. So you want the simulated condition of a real chess board in front of you. That's the whole point, Nick, and I've shown you a lot of reasons why you do. You want that because that's real chess. That's how real men play chess. We didn't get uh, internet chess until the last few years and I've, I've met a number number of people who sit there and play their standard games looking at the board so I mean looking at this two-dimensional board and you need a full three-dimensional chess set okay so either get it right by your computer and, and if you can somebody to make and relay those moves for you that's a wonderful thing now let's see I kind of want to tie this up and come back to a couple things I've given you all these crazy openings to study? Well, they're not really crazy. You'll get an equal game out of them. And how much to study? Well, what's a good way to study them? Well, you can look some of them up in the book. You'll have to do that. But uh, in some cases, you can, if you've got to memorize, you can just write, jump right in. Go play Blitz Chess. Now, we'll talk about Blitz Chess later. Just a safe, a safe thing. Blitz can ruin your chess, okay? Take it from me. I don't play Blitz well because of my style of play. I, I'm not interested in it because I prefer to think and enjoy a game and get into it. There are people that excel at it fine. They, they, a lot of them will not succeed at regular chess where you will. But the point of Blitz Chess, let's just talk about it real quick. The Grandmasters are all playing it. You go to ICC and Robo Admin is always hollering out, Ah, look at this game. Grandmaster so-and-so is playing International Master. Who knows? And it, click here to watch the 3-0 Blitz game. And you watch this game go by flurry moves blah 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 everything happens and and you know if you do a computer evaluation on those moves you're gonna see a lot of those moves really are bad they get winning games and lose them but you know the, the grandmaster is playing these games for fun he's also playing them to learn openings and to learn strategies and to practice what well, a lot of reasons but I think the mindset is just because the grandmasters are playing all these blitz games that we the lower players lower rated players should do the same thing and online chess is set up for that. There's speed events all the time. Well, fine. Don't expect to become really great at chess. Maybe you'll become really great at blitz chess, but it all comes back to how much time do you have for the game? If you have extra time, you can play. You can play these things, and you can learn a little bit about, uh, about the openings and the strategies in a hurry. 
If you have time to run a bunch of correspondence chess games, you can learn them that way. There's all kinds of ways to learn these openings, but like I say, it comes down to your time, and I'll say it again. That's why I designed Lesson 1 as I did. We don't know how much time you have, and I said you need to lot this for this. As long as you're studying your, your standard games and pre preparing uh, what other things you, that tells you to, like go back and learn the opening after you've played the game, go back and learn the end game after you've played the game. That's what I kind of said in Lesson 1. And with your correspondence game, keep going, studying the, studying the things as they're arising, studying the openings as they're arising, studying the end games as they're arising, learning them. You've got your pattern here. Well, here, if you've got extra time beyond that, go play Blitz Chess. Have some fun, okay? Don't worry about your rating. It doesn't measure, the, the, doesn't measure your true strength. Uh, just have fun, okay? So, let's see. What's the closing thought of the day? I, get, I know I've given you a lot of information here, but the information is all designed with a purpose to make you aware. Make you aware of how you can control what happens in your games and take that power away from your opponent. If he doesn't get to play his pet opening against you, he's never going to show you how he would have beat you because you'll never have that chance. But you will be beating him because you know how to play your system. And you can do this with white. When you're, when you're lower rated, you can absolutely do this. Now, when you become a master and you want to go higher, yeah, yeah, you're going to have to go out and do the work and learn some fresh openings. Or stick with what you got here. <laughs> can, can't be bad. I, I've stuck with it. I have my stuff. I play. Like I say, if you've watched my league games that I entertain, I don't know theory here, and I don't. <laughs> I don't. I, I can find good moves from it. I may not find the best move, but I'll find good good moves, and so can you. But stay out of theory, because your opponent will probably know it better than you, especially if you're playing into his line. Okay, that concludes lesson zero zero five, and I really look forward to what you folks have to say. We'll talk to you again real soon with Lesson 006. Thank you so much for your time.